I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, it looks like there are now the same amount of Jews and Arabs living within the Holy Land. Israel and the Palestinians are bracing for what could be a bloody showdown this weekend. And a rare discovery has just been unearthed near the Temple Mount. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. The latest census numbers have just come in and the shocking results may have major political reverb. The study suggests that the number of Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza, when added to the Arab Israelis living in Israel, is now nearly equal to the number of Jews living in the Holy Land. Some are disputing these numbers, but the question of Israel's identity as a Jewish state has nonetheless surged to the top of the national debate. If a population parity has been reached, it would mean that Jews no longer hold a demographic majority in the land between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. Some Israeli lawmakers say this may herald a new age in Israel's future, in which the country sacrifices democracy for the sake of maintaining its Jewish identity. Namely, by possibly refusing Arab citizens the right to vote. Other Knesset members and analysts argue that a population parity exposes the impossibility of annexing the West Bank for a one-state solution, because Jews would then be forfeiting their own majority. And I insist, the moment we will annex the West Bank and Gaza, we will be minority, and this is the end of the Zionist dream. Growing settlements in disputed parts of the West Bank with an eye on annexing areas of the West Bank altogether has been largely condemned as illegal by most of the world, but remains a top objective of Netanyahu's administration. Arab Knesset members say these numbers reflect a very harsh truth. If Israel doesn't opt for the two-state solution, the risk falls on both Jews and Palestinians. Both the IDF and the Palestinians are bracing for what could potentially be a very bloody showdown starting this weekend. The United Nations is begging both sides to de-escalate and avoid violence, particularly involving children. Palestinians in both Gaza and the West Bank will commemorate Land Day this weekend by holding a massive demonstration along the border. Land Day marks the anniversary of Israel's expropriation of Galilee land, and Hamas says this protest will be merely a peaceful sit-in. But considering Hamas's militia has just conducted its first ever live fire drill in the Strip, that seems unlikely. That drill triggered the Iron Dome to accidentally misfire nearly a million dollars worth of defensive rockets. The army says the ammunition fire in Gaza was misread as rocket fire and that the system's oversensitivity is merely an extra safety precaution. But it comes at a time when Hamas is certainly looking for weaknesses in Israel's impenetrable defensive system. Another possible red flag is the ramped Hamas security on the Erez border checkpoint between Gaza and Israel. Hamas initially handed over all checkpoints to the PA during the unity deal, but now that the deal is dissolving, Hamas seems to be seizing power back. The Palestinians' protest happens to overlap with the eve of Passover, which begins this Friday at sundown. IDF forces arrested three Palestinians from Gaza this morning after the trio illegally crossed into Israel from the Strip armed with knives and grenades. The three would-be terrorists made it nearly 20 kilometers over the border to the area of Tse'elim in southern Israel. And here now with more on this alarming infiltration is Dr. Martin Sherman, founder and executive director of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies. Thanks for joining us. So. How could something like this have happened? I mean, they got, you know, 20 kilometers within Israeli territory. Well, at the micro level, it's, it's, it's clearly a very disturbing incident. And it shows that uh, you can't build on 100% success rate in patrolling and sealing the border. But, but you know, you can say, well, what could you do? You can increase the number of uh, patrols, ambushes, drones with mm -hmm. night vision, uh, infrared detectors, etc., etc. But 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 I think it's it's a, it's a mistake to look at this incident in isolation. Right. You know, I, I'd like to well, say, say three well, things. Yeah, I, I mean, know. I'd like to hear hear what you're going to say, but I also would like to know if you think that this particularly ca this particular case has anything to do with the planned uh, Hamas demonstrations that we're going to be seeing over the weekend. Well, well, I don't know for sure, but it's certainly not implausible. Uh, and, and I think the, the planned mass marches are far more disturbing 
than a missed uh, infiltration, which was eventually caught. Mm -hmm. um, but as, again, you know, imagine the same thing if we had relinquished Judea and Samaria to Palestinian rule. There you don't have a 50 kilometer border, there you have a 500 kilometer border, not adjacent to a, a sparsely populated rural area, but adjacent to Israel's most densely populated urban area. So, so that, that's, that's the one thing. The, the second thing is I think it's, it's a mistake to look at this in terms of a tactical operational sense. You have to look at this in the strategic conceptual sense. And, uh, you, know, you know, because the Palestinians keep changing their modus, uh, modus, vivendi, modus operandi. Uh, first you had uh, attacks with light arms, then you had suicide bombers, then you had uh, tunnels and rockets and missiles and knives. They keep changing tactics. And I think this, this, well, this, in, in, uh, this indicates the total collapse of the land for peace concept and the two-state solution. All right. Well, do you think the new um, and obviously very expensive border wall around Gaza um, that is going to be completed in 2019 will will be able to um, prevent future infiltrations well, like it'll this? It'll certainly make it much more difficult. But then again, I go back to Jeddah and Samaria. If you have a 50-kilometer uh, border, that's one thing. If you've mm -hmm. got a 500-kilometer border, which you have to close off from tunnels, that's another thing. And, you know, it's supposed to be 40 meters deep. So, so what happens if they d dig a tunnel 42 meters deep? You know, it'll certainly make it harder, but I, do, I don't think it's the ultimate solution. The ultimate yeah. solution is something far more drastic, uh, which I'm sure we don't have time to go into. Well, unfortunately, we don't, but thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we will have to wait and see what happens with the future of these infiltrations. All right. One of the powers granted to an Israeli president is the authority to issue pardons to prisoners. Well, in honor of Israel's upcoming 70th birthday, President Ruben Rivlin is about to use that power for an incredible new initiative. The program would grant an easier pardoning process to Israelis who have already served at least a third of their time in prison, excluding those who have committed serious crimes concerning national security. President Rivlin says the program is meant to grant a second chance to those who need it most, and of course, only to those who qualify. For example, prisoners who suffer from a serious disease or who are over the age of 70 will potentially qualify for the program. Along with any prisoners who were abused by victims of their own crime or prisoners whose kids are being taken care of by a legal guardian instead of a parent because of their sentence. Pardons will be carefully considered on a case-by-case -case basis with the Justice Ministry. The severity of the offense will obviously be a primary factor here, which is why crimes of murder, manslaughter, security offenses, or any kind of sex crimes will automatically not be considered. Many are commending Rivlin for taking a hard action to help reshape Israel's rehabilitation system. Still, others worry that this may excuse white-collar or financial crime and potentially benefit those who have caused the system so much harm in the first place. Some human rights activists also worried that this may be an attempt to clear out space in overcrowded Israeli prisons, ahead of the expected incarceration of thousands of African asylum seekers under the government's controversial new deportation plan. Regardless, President Rivlin has inspired much optimism with this new initiative. He says, quote, I would like to see in the 70th year of the state of Israel the opportunity to extend a long hand, a helping hand, an opportunity to stop, to look to see those who we may not routinely see. It's been just a few days since roughly 20,000 Israelis gathered in Tel Aviv to protest the government's attempt to deport African migrants and asylum seekers. Well, thanks to a couple of petitions filed recently with the High Court of Justice, at least some of these asylum seekers may now have a brighter future ahead. ILTV's Aaron Porras has more on the story. Now, Aaron, mm -hmm. the deportations are still frozen by the High Court, are they not? Uh, they are. The state's plan is to give asylum seekers the choice between $3,500 and a plane ticket uh, or prison, and, and that was deemed unconstitutional. The state was then given a week to make its case, but now the government is actually asking for an extension to April 9th, mm -hmm. though that's not likely going to help them because of the Passover holidays. The government is continuing to hand out deportation notices, though, mm -hmm. right? Uh, true, yeah, uh, but the Population Authority can't actually physically deport anybody until the case with the High Court is resolved. All right, now tell me, you know, a little bit more about these recent petitions. What is the supposed good news here? Right, so, so thanks to at least two petitions filed by human rights attorneys, Carmel and Michal Pomerantz, the state will now be required to finally review some of the asylum applications of, of the nearly 1,100 refugees from Darfur and another 400 refugees from the Nuba area in Sudan.
Further, the state promised to apply any sweeping court decisions about the Darfurians to those from Nuba as well. Well, that's good news because it essentially means that Israel has acknowledged the Nuba genocide yeah. by pairing the victims of that regional conflict to those from neighboring Darfur. Yeah, and, and it's also great because it hopefully means the better treatment of asylum seekers currently in detention or waiting to be processed, too. You're referring to recent reports of detaining Darfurians, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, like in 2016, the state promised it would stop detaining asylum seekers from Darfur because of their refugee status, but then they kept mm -hmm. doing it up until the Cholot detention facility was closed just a few weeks ago. And basically, the only excuse that the state didn't, uh, that the excuse had was that the state didn't know they were from Darfur. Well, this is certainly a story that should be followed carefully now, and thanks, uh, Aaron, for coming in and, and telling us more. All right. As if you needed any more proof of the strength of the Israeli-U.S. friendship, Congress has just approved a massive record-high funding boost to Israel's military. Israel's Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman broke the news himself. This year, America will send a jaw-dropping $705 million to help protect Israel's borders. That's nearly $150 million up from last year's budget. The Defense Ministry has confirmed these funds will go directly towards beefing up Israel's Iron Dome defense system. There is an upgrade in the Iron Dome already underway to make the Arrow 3 missile system more accurate and also boost the system's overall range. Coincidentally, tests for that upgrade will commence in Alaska this summer in coordination with the United States. Lieberman has thanked the U.S. for investing $6.5 billion to date in Israel's defense. The United States has an additional stake in perfecting the Iron Dome. Rumors have long been swirling that America may set up its own Iron Dome system over U.S. soil in the future. Numerous countries have been reportedly vying for their own Iron Dome tech as well, which means America's investment could be worth even bigger bucks someday soon. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, just 18 percent of people with disabilities are employed, over a third of which are only employed part time. Well, one Israeli company is trying to change the taboo around employing people with disabilities. And joining us with more is Dr. Gil Winch, the founder and CEO of Kal, of Kal Yachol. Kal Yachol. Is it Kol Yachol or Kal Yachol? Kol Yachol. Kol Yachol. C -A -L -L. Right. Kol. OK, very cool. Kal Yachol. All right. So tell us about your company. Well, we started out 10 years ago. Um, as a free market company, but most of the company, two-thirds of the company, yeah. and staff of, and management are severely disabled individuals who have been previously unemployed, chronically unemployed. And we opened the company in order to prove that a wide range of severely disabled people can attain regular productivity and be like everyone else. Well, you know, I, just, I, I mentioned that right before uh, we started this interview, that there is a taboo that exists around the disabled community yes. when it comes to work. Can you talk to us a little bit about that, kind of the issues that some of these yeah, people face? Yeah, I, I first heard about, about the rate of unemployment about 16 or 15, 16 mm -hmm. years ago, and it didn't make sense because we're not doing the agriculture thing anymore. Yeah. And there's no reason why people who are sitting on a wheelchair who are, who are legally blind, there's no right. reason for them The majority them not of us are sitting right uh, in front of a desk so all day long. So why are they right? out of work? And, yeah. and we, we went to find out why. And we tried to interview lots of people, map all the reasons we heard, and put together an operating model that would cater to everything we heard, all, yeah. the, all, the, all the problems we heard. And then to prove it, we opened a for-profit company in order to see that if we survive in the free market, but with our, our staff being mainly disabled people, then there's the proof in the pudding, so to speak. Now, now when you say disabled, are you talking about physical disabilities, mental disabilities? Is there a breakup in terms of, of who you employ and who you help find employment? Yeah, that's a great question because everybody has the, yeah. the categories going. Yeah. But we found out that if you've been at home for 10 or 20 years unemployed, it doesn't matter what your official disability is, you have a various range of traumas and rejection syndrome, uh, symptoms yeah. that, that those are the biggest hindrance to getting back to the work, workplace. We right. hire everybody other than cognitively uh, disabled people because we're free market, they can't survive the, 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 the training. Right. But other than that, mental, emotional, uh, wheelchair, blind, deaf, we hire And And everybody. so you also help place uh, these people with other jobs. No, Two? they no? all okay. work for us. We are they the, we are the employer. Yeah, and we so, outsource to different companies, but they're all our employees. Very interesting. In our so, what has the response been to this business model that you've created? Well, it's, actually, it's been amazing because we didn't know that there's no such company in the world before we opened. Yeah. But there isn't. So we've had more than sixty countries come to visit us to see how this thing works. Of it course. works in three languages and. 
and we have various places. Uh, we operate from a few various branches. We have very, very diverse managerial teams, mm -hmm. and and it works amazingly, amazingly well, and it totally changes all the... Yeah, was there a personal story that led to this, or it was just seeing these statistics that bothered you? Well, I was, I was told uh, a long, long time ago that I, I have incurable cancer and that I'm, I have a very short lifespan. And they gave me an awful lot of disability because of that, yeah. but not that I'm disabled in any kind of way. Right. And that got us thinking that I would like to do something with the time I have left, which is a lot as far as I'm yeah, concerned. Yeah, of course. To make the world a bit of a better place than it was, and, and this is well, what we Well, I mean, we found. you clearly already are. I think this is incredible what you're doing, and I really hope that people pick up this business model around the world. It's good that you're having people come and visit. Yeah, there's a lot of interest, actually, yeah. so hopefully it will. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us, My Doctor. pleasure, thank you. All right, well, this is amazing. Last week, a small Israeli medical team made a life-saving trip to Ethiopia where they conducted five much-needed spinal surgeries. The patients were all minors, meaning that without this treatment, their afflictions could have been lethal. This delegation of eight doctors, two nurses, and one physical therapist comes from Jerusalem's Hadassah Medical Center. This is actually Hadassah's fifth year of collaboration with this particular hospital in Ethiopia, the Aden Comprehensive Specialized Hospital. Aiden treats roughly 8 million patients in Ethiopia, but lacks a spine surgeon. So, when these five cases of extreme spinal deformity came up, Israel quickly dispatched a team of experts in the field and performed the surgeries just in time. Dr. Josh Schroeder co-led the team's mission and says that at least half of the cases were so severe that the patients would have been dead by next year. Given the amazing tech and medical services at Israel's disposal, it's important to see the country giving back like this whenever and wherever it can. Israel's 70th anniversary is fast approaching, and here in Tel Aviv, the Gina Gallery of International Naive Art is commemorating the occasion with a very special exhibition. Joining me now in the studio with more is Tirza Horin Karagula, a naive artist participating in the Land We Love exhibition, and Dan Chill, the founder and curator of the Gina Gallery. Thanks for joining us. All right, so first tell me about what naive art is. Interesting name. Naive art is a genre. It's not a style, but a genre. And it has a stream of art with several characteristics, including a simple, easy to understand scene, mm -hmm. an idealized view of the world, an enchanting innocence in which the artist looks upon the world, and strong colors, uh, heartwarming detail, and uh, what we call childlike perspective, childlike scale. But most important, it celebrates the human narrative. Beautiful. All right. So, Tirza, you yourself are a naive artist. How did you become one? Uh, I started painting 12 years ago. Um, just um, experienced my life, my uh, childhood. I uh, lived in the kibbutz, very uh, naive environment. I felt very comfortable in, yeah. in that place. I feel that in through the naive art I bring to the world and to uh, my vision of, of the beauty of life, of the, of the things we want to put the spot on. Uh, Very cool. Well, uh, I mean, uh, I, I see the bright colors here. There's bright colors. Yeah, and it's beautiful. The, the little spot, the little feeling of what life could be, should be, and how we present. This is yeah. my painting. I love this. A lot of, yeah. it's very idealistic. You can feel, you can see that yeah. in the colors and, and the characters. Um, just, so you just take a very yeah. simple moment and bring the, the good that could be from and remind us um, from the opposite of the chaos of our life yeah. outside in the world. Just Absolutely. Well, I know, I know having some, even looking at this kind of cheers you up, right? So tell us a little bit about the show and uh, what types of pieces we can see. Well, this is a show which is concentrating on the naive art of Israel. In other words, Israel has a distinctive type of naive yeah. art, which uh, celebrates a particular narrative, namely the narrative of our country, the narrative yeah. of our country, whether it's the modern country or even before what they say, kom hamdina, before the beginning of the country. And each artist, uh, tells a story uh, through the paintings, as you see. And it, it tells a heartwarming story, a story of love. Actually, we say of the naive artist that she dips her brush in her heart and begins to paint. Well, I, I mean, and I, I think also what's so interesting about each of the, the paintings that I'm seeing here, at least, is there's so much detail. There's so much to look at. You can't kind of figure out where, what you want to focus on. Um, but what I would say is that I think, you know, in the country that we live in, a country that's marred by 
by war and conflict and, and violence, that's what you see in the news, this is a little bit different, right, than what somebody would typically assume an Israeli artist would uh, draw or paint. So where and when can we catch the show? Well, the show began already. It just opened yeah. last week, but it will continue until early May, and it's at 255 Dizengoff Street. And by the way, the name of the gallery is Gina. Gina, not oh, Gina, I'm sorry. But okay. it's okay. Gina, which is an acronym for Gallery International okay. Naive Art. People think it's my sweetheart, but I, I love the gallery, but my wife is my sweetheart, but yeah. Gina is a very, very special place All to right. visit. Beautiful, and, and Tirza will be able to see your work there as well, right? Yes. All right, thank you guys so much for joining us, thank and you. Uh, thank you. check it out. All right, historians just got a very fitting Passover gift. A handful of rare bronze coins have been discovered in a cave near the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Archaeologists say this incredible find dates all the way back to year four of the Jewish revolt against the Romans and may provide a whole new insight into the Second Temple era. The four-year rebellion against the Roman Empire took place roughly between 66 and 70 CE. In those days, many Jewish rebels hid out in caves in an effort to free the Holy Land from Roman siege. Though many artifacts have been recovered from years one and two of the revolt, evidence from years three and four is especially rare. These coins come from an excavation just below the Temple Mount southern wall. The cave they were found in could very well have been one of the last strongholds of Jewish rebels in the final days before Rome's conquest of Jerusalem. Similar coins recovered from the earlier years of the revolt have for the freedom of Zion inscribed in ancient Hebrew, but many of these coins read for the redemption of Zion, which could mean that by then Jews realized the fate that awaited them, but still held out for hope for the future of a Jewish state. Their discovery just mere days before the Passover or before Passover is a fitting coincidence since the Jewish holiday celebrates the freedom of the Jewish people from ancient Egypt. Historians are excited to investigate what other secrets these coins may yet reveal. All right, if you know anything about the beloved children's character Paddington Bear, then you know Paddington loves nothing more than spreading yummy marmalade on some bread whenever he can. Well, with the Paddington 2 film hitting theaters just in time for Passover, the Israeli movie posters decided to upgrade Paddington's favorite snack, Pesach style. Yes, my friends, it's true. Here in Israel, Paddington is keeping kosher for Passover and spreading that marmalade over the classic Israeli substitute for all things leavened, matzah. I will admit, marmalade is probably the perfect way to give matzah some much-needed pizzazz. Paddington 2 is the much-awaited sequel to the smash hit film in 2014. That film finally brought to life the characters created by beloved children's author Michael Pond back in the 50s, who has since become a mainstay of classic kids' literature. Paddington's adventures have been captured in books, TV, and now two live-action films. The sequel actually premiered here in Israel last week to critical and audience acclaim. Israeli President Uven Rivlin's wife, who is a lifelong Paddington fan, actually provides a voiceover for one of the characters in the Hebrew version of the film. If you ask me, it looks like Paddington kind of enjoys his new matzah blasted snack. Maybe when the third film rolls around, he'll be eating matzah marmalade sandwiches full time. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. There's nothing more annoying than being interrupted. So today's word is lefria, which means to interrupt or disturb in Hebrew. Aaron, we're filming right now. Yeah, go ahead. All right, you guys can use this word to yell at people who are bothering you. There are a lot of things that mafliya or disturb me. People chewing too loudly, people biting their nails, people speaking rudely about my dog. Aaron, why are you I'm, in here right now? Do the show. Right. It's fine. All right. By the way, guys, that means stop interrupting me. No, I'm just sitting here, all right? You do your thing. Anyhow, no matter how many things may mafliya you, it's important to stay calm and collected because the only one who will lose out when you're in a bad mood is you. <laughs> I can't wait. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be partly cloudy and warm with a low of about 64 or 18 degrees or 18 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow is also expected to be partly cloudy and warm through most of the day with a high of 86 or 30 degrees Celsius. But there is a chance of thunderstorms going into tomorrow evening. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.49 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv. 
And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.